Our next speaker today is Dr. Alex Terraud, who's going to talk to you about science in the Southern Ocean. So Alex is actually a spatial ecologist, and he has been leader of our Southern Ocean Ecosystems Program for a number of years now, and that's what he's going to present on today. But it, just as of Monday, he was actually transferred sideways and is now leading that really exciting integrated digital East Antarctica initiative, at least the scoping of that work that um, I talked about this morning. Alex's research crosses species and biomes with a focus on science to inform decision making and my experience of working alongside Alex over the last 15 months is that he is absolutely passionate about that science translation into policy and into decision making. So. Uh, for the next 15 minutes, we're going to get an immersion in our marine science program. Thank you, Nicole. It's a, it's a real pleasure to, to be talking to you today. <coughs> Excuse me. Southern Ocean science, the science we do in the Southern Ocean, is one of the, the key pillars of science in the Australian Antarctic program. We've already heard about how marine science can inform what we understand about climate, not just for Antarctica, but for the rest of the world. And this science also helps us to ensure that the resources and the environments and the species, the biodiversity in the Southern Ocean are well managed and conserved for future generations. When I first went south, when I first ventured into the Southern Ocean in 1993, nearly three decades ago, one of the things that struck me as we started to, to pull things up from the, from the depths was, was the amazing biodiversity, not the, just what we were seeing under the water, but what we were seeing flying around on top, coming out as we were travelling in a ship. And over the last 30 years, it's continued to amaze me, the, the, the incredible biodiversity, which is somewhat captured in this, in this schematic, even though it does miss out the sea floor, which is a a really important part of, of this environment, which a number of people have, have pointed out rightly so. The other thing that has struck me over, over my time of working in the sub-Antarctic, the Antarctic and the Southern Ocean, is the interconnectedness. And this inter interconnectedness is, is somewhat shown in this diagram as well, but it can't even start to capture the complexity of these interactions. And I'm not just talking about interactions between the biodiversity, interactions between the various environments of these places and the biodiversity as well, all come together to make a pretty complex system. I can't do that system justice in 15 minutes, but what I'll try to do is to touch on a few of the key elements, mainly that we lead out of the Antarctic Division. I won't go into the science in too much detail because we have some great snapshots in, in, in some details, but you'll see some overlap, but hopefully a, a broader overview is the intention today. When I'm asked about the why of the Southern Ocean scientists, why, why about the Southern Ocean science, I sort of start to hark back to the, to the very clear guidance, or I start with the clear guidance that is provided to us in some really, I suppose, high level overarching documents. The Australian Antarctic Science Strategic Plan, the, Austra the Antarctic Strategy and 20 Year Action Plan, and the Australian Antarctic Division's Forward Plan. As I said, there's some very clearly articulated high level guidance here. As we come down, we want some more specifics and, and processes like the decadal planning process, which Nicole is leading across our program, are really important. But so are our interactions with our policymakers. The iterative process of scientists talking to policymakers, understanding what are the contemporary issues of the day, that's another fantastic avenue for us as scientists to understand where we should put our efforts. And what do those efforts look like? Well, if you start off on the left-hand side of the schematic, it's about gathering data. What do those inputs look like? We want to know how much krill is out there. We're very keen on understanding how many fish there are and where are they. What are eating the krill? How many of them are they? Where are those seabirds and whales going? Why are they going there? What sort of environmental interactions are we seeing between all these biodiversity elements of the system? Importantly, what are the change drivers? What effects do our fisheries have on the fish and the krill that they're catching? And what the changing climate, what are the implications of changing climates on these systems as well? It's a complex mix. There's a whole bunch of uh, inputs coming in here. And that's why 
the Antarctic Division, while we manage many of these inputs through separate programs, whether that be the climate program, the Southern Ocean Ecosystem program, programs fo focusing on data acquisition and, and synthesis, long-term monitoring, it's really important for us and across the Antarctic Science Program that we start to integrate these. We look at them in their entirety wherever possible. We start to analyse them together and that gives us the strongest and most insightful outputs. And those outputs take a range of outputs take a range of forms. They might be publications, scientific articles. The research might underpin submissions to a range of global, globally important international fora, whether that be the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, the IWC, or ACAP. But there's also a role for us to play in providing um, advice nationally and interacting with our national policymakers. And Jin gave you some great overviews of, of how that sort of pans out and what's important in the, in the marine mammal space. These, input, these outputs, I should say, contribute to this vision of a well-managed and sustainable fishery and conservation and protection of our Antarctic wildlife. And what that actually looks like is a reduced impact of our human activities. It's species and areas that are protected based on good evidence for the right reasons. And it's about conservation, Camelot conservation measures and catch limits being based on the best available science. Rob did a fantastic job of, of highlighting just how important krill are. And I just wanted to speak a little bit to start with around our flagship project, uh, sustain, the sustainable management of Antarctic krill and the conservation of the krill-based ecosystem. And I'll come back to this concept of the krill-based ecosystem a number of times. Because as I said to start with, it's impossible to look at krill in isolation. We really need to understand its interactions with the rest of the ecosystem. This flagship project provides us with a 10-year roadmap for uh, research into krill and the krill-based ecosystem over the next decade. And again, coming back to the, the outcomes of a, a well-managed and sustainable fisheries and conservation of Antarctic wildlife. It's a big undertaking looking at the krill-based ecosystem and, and we sort of think, well, where do we start? Well, the Noina is a great place to start and, and Nicole did a fantastic job followed by Rob of really highlighting some of the capabilities. I think it's also really important, and I'm not saying that they didn't, but to re-emphasise the importance of the people, the crew, the technical staff, the voyage support and the scientists that are, that are crewing the Noina and allowing this science to happen. And this is something that we've thought about a lot as this amazing capability is com coming to bear, is actually, well, how are we going to make sure that we can use this capability? And I think making sure we've got the right people and the right scientists has been a key part of our forward planning in this, in this respect. But what does it really look like? Well, we take the Noina or, an, or other vessels and we head south. We head to places where we know there are krill. We... Don't do this in isolation. We, 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 as, as I said before, we, we have an um, amazing array of capability on board to understanding what's underneath the water, but we also have observers that are, that are working on, on the ship itself, looking for uh, some of these uh, predators like whales and seabirds. But as we head south, we look towards going to areas that we know are important from a krill point of view. We have some incredible capability that allows us to inject sound, to, to push sound into the water, it reflects back and then provides us with some very clever and analytical techniques, mind you, to get a very important picture of what's under the water. And this is krill. This is the, uh, the, the investigator, the AV investigator. And what we're seeing here, as Rob pointed out, is a, a snapshot, more than a sharp snapshot, a walk in the park, as he said, I like that. A, an understanding of what's underneath the water where the ship's travelling. And by bringing these data back together, we can actually start to get a really detailed picture of what krill look like, how many of them they are, how much of them there are, I should say. How many is probably a little bit beyond our reach at the moment, but how much of them there are, how is this changing over time, and what are the implications of these, uh, of these data for our fisheries? And these data are also really important for our understanding of the predators that feed on krill. We know, as Jim said, um, that a range of whale species travel between Antarctica 
and Australia on an annual sort of basis. We know this because our researchers, our teams, have put satellite trackers on whales. If we complement these broader scale movements, our understanding of these broader scale movements, with the observers that we have on, on board the Nyena or other vessels, we can actually get an understanding of what whales are in the vicinity of the krill that we're seeing. And by doing that, we can actually start to tease out what these interactions might look like to the point where we can actually start to understand things like consumption rates and the, the, the detailed interactions between these marine predators and the krill base and the and krill themselves. But as Jin pointed out, uh, to studying whales isn't easy and we are really starting now to look at more, I suppose, um, innovat innovative ways and technological advances to, to help us to study, study these creatures, whether they be sonar boys or drones. This is in part, I think, the future of some of our, of our um, whale-based research. Another really important set of predators in the krill-based ecosystems are seabirds. We are here in a little while a talk from Barbara Wynicke about emperor penguins. But our seabird teams have been monitoring a daily penguins and a range of other seabirds for many years. In fact, they've led the way in the development of these autonomous cameras, an image of which you can see in the top corner there, that allow us to have insights that we would never get into how these penguins are moving to and from their colonies on a seasonal basis. And again, using satellite tracking um, techniques to understand where they're going when they're not at, at, on, on land. All these elements come together to help us to understand and hopefully to, well, to manage well and sustainably the krill-based ecosystem. I'm going to shift a little bit sideways now, though, and talk about one of the other really important elements of the Southern Ocean, and that's the toothfish and the ice fish. And there are fisheries for these, uh, for these um, fish in the Southern Ocean. Important fisheries, important fisheries for Australia. And our teams are conducting regular stock assessments to understand where these fish are, what their movements are, how many of them there might be, and in doing so, help to formulate appropriate catch limits. We work very closely with industry and government around this fishery to make sure that we can do this. And it's not just about stock assessments. We're really looking for as much information as we can. Again, trying to take a bit more of a whole of ecosystem approach. What's the community structure? What's happening with recruitment? What are their life, what's their life history? And in a little while, Jamie's gonna to talk to you about bycatch because bycatch is another element that we're really interested in. And wherever possible, we must reduce it and mitigate the effects of it. So I've spoken a little bit about all the data we can collect in the ocean, but it's also important to remember that there are other data sources. Satellites, for example, can provide us with really insightful images at broad scales, Imi uh, insights into the, um, the chlorophyll, insights into ocean height, the eddies that are occurring um, across the Southern Ocean, and of course, ocean temperature. And as Rob and, and Nicole talked about, we can actually collect live krill now through our capability in the Noena, bring it back to shore, and we can actually start to now undertake experiments that really do give us important insights into how these uh, fundamental keystone species might change under, under the impacts of climate change. But where does it end? What, why are we really doing this? And I think, for me, it's about science that informs and drives decision making. Both nationally and internationally, our science is fundamental to some of this decision making. And as a result, our science underpins Australia's leadership and influence in these international forums and at home. Our science is changing the world. We're ensuring that we have sustainable and well-managed fisheries. That our management is evidence-based. We're conserving Antarctic wildlife and we're clarifying climate change impacts. And so, as a few people have said, the future is bright, but it's complicated. And I think I want to come full circle now as I talk about the range of data that we, we are collecting, just to reiterate. Satellite data, molecular data, shipboard da data, data from autonomous stations, whether they be uh, weather stations or autonomous cameras. And of course, we're conducting experiments at the, at the ocean and ice interface. And we have so much biological data, both from the marine environment 
and from the terrestrial environments. We have a lot of data, and much of this data is well targeted and collected in, in, a, in, a, in a very productive way with a clear path to impact. But what we don't have, and this is where I talked about coming full circle, is necessarily a, a holistic and integrated framework for understanding what are the most important of these variables to monitor. And it comes back to the, to the question that Nathan asked us when he was speaking just a few minutes ago. What should we be monitoring and why? And I think the East Antarctic Monitoring Program will go a long way to answering some of these questions. And it won't just answer them, it will actually in time develop the framework that can support future monitoring. But this, mon these monitoring, this monitoring is going to produce even more data. And I think the Integrated Digital East Antarctic Initiative is a fantastic platform for bringing together stakeholders, scientists from across the Antarctic community and really starting to put together a package of acquisition, data processing, data management, data synthesis, analysis, modelling, and ending up with outputs that are fit for purpose for a range of environment, a range of stakeholders, whether they be other scientists or policy makers. So I think even though the future might be complicated, it still remains bright, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to playing a part in that. And I'd, I'd like to thank you again for your time today, and when uh, the opportunity arises, I'm happy to answer any questions.